Danes are very rule uh, abiding and they're very lawful. I never jaywalk when I'm in Denmark. Um, but I do notice that when they're on their bike, they get in touch with their inner Viking. <laughs> so I thought this, this might trigger off a Pavlovian response that'll be more irritating for the cyclists in the audience that come in. Um, we're off to a fantastic start, um, and Harvey's laid the groundwork for the globe, for the planet. And um, you can see what a revel I mean, many of us in the room have lived through this. It's quite st astonishing to think that uh, the discovery of a new parameter, a new drive metric, an imaginary thing called a deli, would put mental illness on the radar screen. So we could make what was not measurable, measurable. And we could get at that dark matter, the dark underbelly of the burden of mental disorders on the planet. And so GBD, is, it's, a, it's a seismic or tectonic shift in, uh, in the way ep epidemiology is, is being done. And one of the things I tell my colleagues in epidemiology is that we have to get in the slipstream. We can't sit back and tut tut like this is not good epidemiology, they're doing too much imputation and we don't like missing data and we, we like observable data. Well, that's the way we did it in the 20th century and now we need to use the best tools and the best analyses. So I'm now going to introduce you to our next speaker, uh, Dan Chisholm. Uh, Dan is a health economist, did his PhD at the London School of Economics, worked with a very eminent um, uh, health economist, uh, Martin Knapp, and uh, he works for the WHO. He was in the Geneva office, were involved in mental health, and last year he moved to uh, the European office, which is based in Copenhagen, and he's now involved in mental health and non-communicable diseases. And it's a nice segue from Harvey's talk, because Dan has to take those metrics and convince governments to invest and change the structure of health funding. So, Dan, we very much look forward to your presentation. Most welcome. So, um, yeah, that sounds a bit better, doesn't it? Uh, great to be here. I'm really pleased to make these uh, connections, both uh, with um, the UQ gang, who I know for many years, uh, but also new connections with, uh, with the ambassador. Fantastic to be able to, uh, to come and uh, join this event. So, uh, yes, very much a segue, I think, from what Harvey was already uh, talking about. Um, so, um, the UQ team, as I will call them, um, have spent so many years developing uh, methods and then generating the, the, uh, the data. Um, but who uses the data? Uh, people like me, actually. Um, I'm a voracious user of uh, GBD uh, in the work that uh, uh, I do, both from a um, uh, in the work I do on uh, generating evidence and research for uh, uh, information uh, for policy in the area of mental health, um, but um, also uh, talking um, about sort of broader priority uh, setting uh, issues and uh, where psychiatric epidemiology fits in. So I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm not a psychiatric epidemiologist. My uh, background is in uh, health economics, but even before that, social anthropology. But even then, you see, um, you know, the topics uh, of, uh, of the discussion today uh, were coming up. I was particularly interested in transcultural psychiatry. So um, as Harvey was pointing out, you know, there is, uh, uh, you know, uh, differences in the way that uh, mental illness is manifested or, or believed to occur, you know, the causation of, uh, and belief models. Uh, but there's also another strand of transcultural psychiatry, which is looking for the, uh, the norms and the, the commonalities across cultures in terms of, for example, uh, rates of psychosis. Um, is schizophrenia a, a universal phenomenon or not? Uh, so this is an area of uh, long-standing interest uh, for me. Um, so I wanted to um, touch on three basic points here. Uh, over the next uh, few minutes. So first is a kind of pat on the back. Um, it's the um, 
what uh, psychiatric epidemiology has achieved to date um, as a field. Uh, and I'm not just talking about the global burden of disease, although that is perhaps the most noticeable uh, manifestation of that. Um, but I can honestly say that uh, psychiatric epidemiology has really provided critical uh, inputs and insights into uh, our understanding of mental health as a public health uh, and indeed development priority, uh, not just at the local but also the, the global level. So I'll give, give a few examples, a few more visualizations of that and how uh, that enters into the work. But I also want to um, uh, stress what I, Parvi was already saying at the end of his talk, which is how the data that is generated through good psychiatric epidemiological research um, provides a really critical input into, uh, into other areas of great importance to uh, public uh, mental health whether that's through the planning of appropriate services. You need to know the number of people we're talking about, how many people are out there have a need for care and treatment. Um, what is the, the resource consequences of meeting that need? So uh, estimating the, uh, the costs and uh, resource needs, um, that again requires uh, those underlying inputs. Um, also understanding the economic impact. So when we talk about the burden of disease coming from an epidemiological perspective, that's one thing. You can also do a, 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 a exactly the same kind of approach to estimating the impact or burden uh, of mental disorders on the population level, but taking an economic perspective. So in a way, instead of using dallies, you're using dollars, but you still need to know something about the number of people who are exposed to then be able to say, okay, and then this is the cost per person uh, in contact with services or whatever, and multiply that up. Um, and I'll say something, um, although not too much, about the, uh, the cost effectiveness uh, side of things as well. So that's point two. And then the third point is around the, the new challenges ahead, um, and in particular, the sustainable development goals. And I think it's one, a very uh, valuable uh, opportunity that's sort of presented by the inclusion of mental health in the SDGs. Um, and what that implies, though, for uh, new frontiers of uh, scientific discovery, let's call it. Um, and particularly the emphasis on, uh, on uh, inclusion, uh, social justice, uh, human rights. There's a number of topics which have been given a lot of you know, new re-emphasis and have strong connections to mental health. And I think as a result, uh, it's opening up new challenges in terms of measurement uh, about uh, how do we, for example, look at the, the links between mental health on the one hand and some of these underlying uh, social determinants of health and better understanding of that to uh, guide us towards better intervention strategies. So that's, that's it in, in a nutshell. So I'll expand on some of these points over the next uh, few minutes. So this is a typical um, GBD type slide, one I use on my travels. I spend a lot of time traveling around the WHO European region, which is not just Western Europe and Eastern Europe, but also the Caucasus and the Balkans and even Central Asian uh, republics. And of course, the first thing that uh, policymakers or other stakeholders in the area of mental health want to know is how big is the problem? Now, I find most policymakers have a problem with dallies. They don't understand what dallies are. So you'd have to spend the kind of 15 minutes that uh, Harvey uh, spent um, explaining exactly what that means. And that's fine for a more specialized audience, but often they just want to know how many people are, are, are exposed to this problem in my population. This is for the whole of this uh, large WHO European region of 53 member states. Uh, and it just shows very, very simply um, a couple of things. One is the, the change over time that we've seen but from 1990 in the, uh, the prevalence, the total number of cases, uh, but also the breakdown of those and showing, for example, uh, just how common these uh, so-called common mental disorders of depression and anxiety really are. You can see what a, a large proportion of that total uh, burden um, is represented by those two uh, conditions alone. So this is a kind of, you know, a, a starting point that often, uh, you know, you, you would do. And then you would often, um, you know, focus in on the, on the country. I think you saw a slide, um, yeah, a bit like this one um, already. This is 
could have been for Denmark or Australia, but this one is for Serbia. I must have been in Serbia recently. Um, and uh, is, again, just giving a very useful uh, indication to, um, to whoever you're talking to, actually, to situate the, the policy discussion. It might be around uh, how to develop uh, you know, uh, uh, services or, or, or a policy for children and adolescents, or um, might be looking on how to scale up uh, interventions for common mental disorders in adulthood or whatever. Uh, this provides crucial information, particularly in countries where they might not have existing psychiatric uh, epidemiological surveys that have been generated in locally in the country. So this becomes a kind of a default set of numbers, which they can, you can always say, well, you know, it's not from Serbia, therefore, you know, we can't, we can't use this, we can't buy into this, but actually, all epidemiology involves estimation. Um, it's, just a it's just a matter of degree of, of, uh, of the, the, uh, the accuracy uh, and the, or the uncertainty around those estimates. Uh, so there is a little bit more uncertainty, obviously, when you're drawing in information from uh, neighboring countries to Serbia rather than maybe from Serbian uh, data itself. Um, but from a policy point of view, it's more than sufficient as a guide to where are the real problems. Just as Harvey was showing, you can see the proportion of overall, um, this is uh, looking at the, the non-fatal disease burden, the YLDs, you can see the proportion, even, and in some groups it's reaching up to uh, you know, over to, uh, around 30% at certain age groups in, uh, in the male population. Uh, and you can also see um, how there are differences between males and females. For example, here in this early age group of conduct disorders, and you can see there's a much higher rate uh, in males, just like there is for substance use disorders, whereas um, depression and anxiety are more common amongst uh, in the female population. So this is again a very useful kind of tool, which using every every week, you know, in the in the everyday work that. Um, uh, not just me, but other people working in WHO in the region, at the global level, at the country level, are using on a, on a virtually basically a daily basis um, to uh, inform our member states. Here is the suicide data for the European region. Um, actually, more than that, it's showing some of the other regions as well. This is the sort of scatter plot of different countries. You can see huge variation and then some, some averages for the world as, as a whole. And then this would be the average, for example, for the European region. And then the actual data for each of those countries, again, showing uh, extraordinary variations, really, um, even in countries which are neighboring. You have Kazakhstan here with one of the highest rates of suicide in the world. And you've got, for example, Tajikistan uh, over here, uh, right down the other end. They're not that far apart um, geographically. Culturally, there are some differences, but you do wonder how there could be such uh, variation. And that's still a big question, which I don't have the answer to. But um, Denmark, I think, is, uh, yes, highlighted there, uh, right sort of towards the, uh, the, the mid-range uh, across the region. So again, you can see how, how very valuable this information is for, um, for engaging policymakers in a uh, discussion about how to, for, in this case, you know, how to develop more appropriate suicide prevention uh, strategies. <coughs> so, um, so that's some of the really you know, basic epidemiological data, the prevalence, the burden, the suicide, the, the fatal outcomes, the, the actual suicides associated with these disorders. <coughs> um, but thinking also about some of the other critical variables which um, psychiatric epidemiology has also been able to uh, provide much uh, information on, not enough, but, but you know, um, still a very important start. Uh, so this is, uh, what I'm talking about here is treated prevalence, rather than prevalence, but the, the treated prevalence, um, which you know, can also talk about in terms of the treatment coverage or the treatment gap in mental disorders, the, the proportion of people who are, who are not receiving um, any kind of uh, treatment or care. This is providing, um, is showing uh, results from the World Mental Health Survey, uh, which Harvey briefly alluded to. Um, across many countries. I just picked out some of the, uh, the European countries. Uh, and a couple of things to, to point out here. This is looking at the difference between contact coverage, you know, sort of basic definition. Are, is someone, has someone been in contact with mental health services in the last one year, for example? Uh, versus a different concept, which is effective coverage. And that's to do with 
the quality of the, of the coverage. So did people in contact with services receive the services that they, they needed? Did it, was it you know, provided at a therapeutic dose? Did they get a more than an adequate level of um, uh, intervention? And you can see that the numbers, again, range quite uh, dramatically. Um, but, and some of them are really staggeringly low. These are still, e remember, EU member states. And you can see that in places like uh, Romania and Bulgaria, the effective coverage rate is, is deplorably low. I mean, it's 10, 15 percent or, or less, actually, in Bulgaria's case. Um, so you, you consider the equivalent in NCDs of hypertension or diabetes. These would be scandalously low. But this is the reality in Europe uh, for, for depression. Uh, so it's pretty much at the bottom of the heap, I would say, when it comes down to um, you know, uh, levels of, of, of access and coverage, particularly when you, when you take a more strict definition of that, of that coverage and decent coverage, effective coverage. So moving to another area, um, the numbers that um, are needed to do a population-based estimation of the costs of doing something about, uh, as, as, as we were saying, about uh, not just estimating the burden of disease, the attributable burden of disease, but looking at the avertable burden of disease. How much of that attributable burden can we avoid through more appropriate and effective intervention strategies? So we need some information in order to calculate that at a population level. Fine, we need demographic data, we need population uh, information by sex and age and so on. The next thing you need is epidemiological data. You need to know something about the incidence and the prevalence and the, the mortality rates for these uh, different uh, diseases of interest. That is the, 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 the building blocks for, for such an analysis. And then another critical variable is coverage. You need to know what is the coverage now, how many people in need in that population are getting the services that they need? How many would you like to reach in the next five or 10 years? This is typically the, the dialogue, you know, which is, okay, we want to revise our, uh, our mental health policy or plan over the next five years or the next 10 years. Um, so then it's like, okay, well, you're at these levels now, I just showed you very low, modest levels. Where do you want to reach in the next five, 10 years? And that's a kind of policy decision, if you like. Um, and then on the basis of that, you can also work out, um, okay, well, this many people have the condition. What are the current consequences um, of that um, in terms of unmet need, but also in terms of things like lost productivity? So this is getting to the economic burden or impact of, um, of these disorders. And uh, showing you here some, again, some results from a, an analysis we did for a, a big uh, World Bank meeting a couple of years ago now. Uh, uh, totting up all of the, the, the days uh, out of role, uh, days lost from work, people who are not able to work because of their condition, or people who take, take more time out. So we all take time out, whatever, uh, uh, wherever we are. So that's the, um, the compar the, so look, look, looking at two types of lost uh, productivity. Um, this is the total. But the, the, the red parts are the ones which are over and above what people generally take, you know, with, comparing physical and other conditions as well. So you can see that there is a quite a, a heavy excess um, for this particular condition of depression. Um, and uh, you can also work out the, the cost of that. Um, and uh, globally speaking, we were able to uh, estimate that the, the total lost productivity due to uh, these common mental disorders is over one trillion dollars uh, per year lost uh, economic output. Then turning it around, think, okay, so here are the consequences. This is the number of people. This is the very large unmet need in the population. How do we how do we close that gap? Uh, what's it going to cost to scale up services to make it available? And what are we going to get back? What are we going to get back in terms of health? Um, recovered health, restoration of, of health itself, but also because of the restored health, how much restored productivity would we get? So again, a whole bunch of assumptions and estimates and calculations, we can work out the, the return on investing in uh, mental health uh, services. So that's shown on the right hand side and expressed as a ratio of benefit to cost. Um, 
either just looking at the, um, the, the straight economic returns in terms of lost productivity, or also uh, if we include the actual intrinsic value of health, uh, which is somewhat independent from health's instrumental value and able to do the things that we want to do and go back to work or, uh, or, or whatever it might be. Uh, this is the global um, uh, story. Uh, just summarizing those the results of this global analysis, looking at different um, countries at different uh, levels of income, um, from low to high uh, income. We looked at 36 countries, um, the largest countries in the world, captured around 80 or 90 percent of the world's population through this, uh, this study. And you can see that there isn't a huge amount of variation, so, um, which in a way is a good sign, um, because even in the, the sort of low, uh, lower middle income countries, the return is just as, uh, as, um, as, as high. So this is the kind of information that starts from psychiatric epidemiology and then you build and build and build in other in pieces of information to enable uh, this kind of analysis to be uh, undertaken. And actually this is really what a lot of the, getting back to Harvey's point, is that well, what, how do we actually change this? And part of it is generating uh, you know, uh, robust enough evidence to convince policymakers to uh, move in this, um, in this to, towards uh, addressing this agenda. Yes, sure. Uh, so the, the blue is the depression, the red is anxiety, and again, these are showing the, the ratio of benefit to cost. So for every one dollar that you put in, you will get this many dollars back uh, in terms of uh, restored health and productivity. So in the case of the uh, depression in low-income countries, for one dollar in, you get $4.2 dollars back. So you know, any number bigger than one, it means that it's, it's a, a positive ratio. So, um, you know, four or five is, you know, it's not amazing uh, compared to some, some investments in health, um, but it's also not that bad either. <laughs> if it was 1.5, we might have more of a struggle. Um, this is, you know, basically demonstrating clear, um, clear uh, benefit of um, greater investment. So I want to turn now to um, the, the the new kind of agenda um, and the the um, some of the challenges ahead. I think um, for the field, um, which is the SDGs. So I think probably you're all familiar with these SDGs. There's 17 of them, uh, and there's a whole bunch of targets uh, 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 in, embedded within these uh, 17 separate goals. There's a huge number of indicators that have been eventually, eventually, eventually agreed uh, for uh, assessing the uh, uh, achievement of these uh, targets and goals. Uh, it's been a very long uh, process uh, that was take, taken to arrive at these, um, but the result is a very uh, comprehensive, holistic, uh, and inclusive set of uh, goals. Um, Mental health, um, as Harvey pointed out, um, was uh, very clearly left out of the, the former set of uh, UN international goals, the Millennium Development Goals. Um, but the good news is that it's been very explicitly and specifically included in the, in the SDGs. So in the, in the health goal, um, there is a target 3.4, which is the one on NCDs um, and the reduction of premature mortality from NCDs. Um, but also this um, uh, inclusion of the promotion of mental health and well-being. So that's a huge, that's a huge thing because in many countries, I mean, in Denmark, doesn't matter, you know. I mean, mental health can still be a national priority. But for many countries, particularly those relying more on donor uh, external support, um, it's a huge difference because in the former MDG area, they say, yeah, yeah, mental health is important, but you know, it's not in the MDGs and all our financing and support, it's all aligned to those uh, targets and goals. So the fact that it's in now means that there's a huge new opportunity for, uh, uh, it, it, it helps just to have it on the agenda, but also increases the chance of having a meaningful new uh, investment into the area. There's a separate target on uh, substance abuse, um, reflecting the huge concern in uh, uh, many countries of the increasing uh, problem with uh, drug abuse and harmful use of alcohol. Uh, and then there's this uh, um, uh, unifying kind of health goal, which is this concept of universal health coverage. Um, 
and that covers not just the issue of access um, in the geographical sense of having access to services to near wh where you need them, but it's also capturing financial access or, or coverage or, or what we can call it financial protection. So in other words, and it's not just enough to have access to services, but if I can't actually end up using them because I, can't, I don't have any insurance, I, don't, I can't actually afford to pay for those services out of pocket, then that's a huge problem, um, for, particularly for poorer parts of the, uh, the, the, the community or population. So these two concepts are captured within the, um, the concept of uh, universal health coverage, or UHC. Uh, so, of course, in trying to achieve that goal, that covers really uh, all uh, c conditions and, and disorders and diseases, including uh, mental health, substance abuse. So that's the specific uh, area where mental health is included and mentioned. Um, so um, that, that in itself is important, but what about all of these other goals? Okay, the non-health SDGs, okay? So here I think also there is an enormous opportunity uh, to uh, exploit or, or take advantage of um, because of the links between mental health on the one hand and these other SDGs. Let me give you some examples. In fact, I've summarized uh, an example of using, um, a, uh, I think it's published already, but if not, it's, it's on its way very soon. In Lancet Psychiatry, um, of close colleague um, Crick Lund and others as part of the uh, uh, preparation of a Lancet Commission on Global Mental Health, which is coming out in a few months' time, um, did a systematic review looking at this issue of the social determinants um, of uh, mental disorders and, their, and the links between uh, that and the, uh, these SDGs. So what you have here summarized in one graphic, um, well, is one that this is meant to depict the life course approach. <laughs> um, and then you have these different levels of risk factors, okay, affecting all of these people across the life, uh, the life course. The more proximal ones, so we can have examples of, you know, I already showed you the, the differences between, for example, uh, age as a risk factor for certain disorders, uh, gender, um, place of living, ethnicity in some cases, um, would be examples of proximal uh, risk factors. We know, for example, about uh, on the econ in the economic domain about the uh, the effect of unemployment. You know, uh, on um, levels of depression. There's a strong uh, risk factor there. Um, so these sort of proximal factors, the sort of more individual level. And then if we also con consider some of these more distal factors. So again, if you think about the economic domain, there's unemployment as a risk factor at the individual level. But what about something more broad, like the, the recession, uh, recessionary impact uh, that we've seen in Europe over the last few years? And what effect has ha that had? There's actually good evidence of how that has had an influence on suicide rates um, and on levels of uh, common mental disorders. So th this is trying to summarize some of these um, myriad of different uh, determinants or factors in a structured way. So we identified these five different domains, demographic, economic, and then through to um, neighborhood uh, issues, so around social networks and uh, capital, uh, the obvious effects of wars or disasters, natural, uh, natural disasters and, and broader conflicts on uh, rates of uh, mental disorder, uh, and, um, and so on. So this, and then mapping it to the relevant SDGs. So I see this as a, as a really um, important, not just map, this is a kind of an initial mapping, but it also points to the need for, uh, for um, better measurement in some of these areas. So the main um, challenges that I would say, um, one is how to actually measure what it says in the SDG target 3.4, which is around the promotion of mental health and well-being. A second one is around the UHC concept and how do we do better uh, a job of measuring service coverage and also financial coverage uh, across countries. And then, as I pointed out, the third is around the social determinants. How do we do a better job of showing these links and increasing the uh, evidence um, and understanding about those? So some of the research needs, for example, like thinking about some longitudinal epidemiological studies. Um, you know, what, for example, 
uh, is this pathway or mechanism of poverty as a risk factor for mental disorders. How, we know something about it, but not, not enough, not, not, and in many places very little information. Or the effect of income inequality and how, for example, differences in, in, in income inequality, which is pretty well measured across countries, what is the correlation or association between that and levels of, uh, of, of mental uh, uh, health or illness? And more exciting things like you know, link, like you have a uh, plan for next year, the uh, the links between um, you know the biological and genetic factors as well as socioeconomic indicators. So a range of research kind of um, needs, I think, gets gets kind of stimulated by this uh, SDG uh, agenda. Um, so just to summarise, then um, the three points again. Back to my first slide. Um, so the psychiatric epidemiology, uh, as I think I've shown, um, was developed really considerably, and you saw all the fancy visualization, and, but underlying that is an incredible amount of uh, new uh, uh, data that's been collected and synthesized. Um, and that's made a huge impact on establishing mental disorders as a leading cause of, of disease, disease burden. Um, but also through that, I think, really has uh, put you know, mental health on a on a global health kind of priority list that perhaps wouldn't be the case without it. Um, then, of course, uh, the, the data that has been um, generated has provided a strong foundation for many other uh, aspects of uh, relevant work in the area of public mental health, as I've mentioned. Um, and now I think it needs, it's time to reflect and think, OK, done a good job so far, and we can always do better on uh, uh, discovering um, well, new methods and improving the knowledge base around coverage. But then there's a whole new agenda, I think, of exciting new um, opportunities, research opportunities, uh, looking at the, uh, the links between some of these uh, uh, social and economic factors on the one hand uh, and mental health outcomes on the other. So if we say, for example, um, Poverty is an important risk factor for mental health. Okay, so let's 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 do a better job of understanding how how those pathways work and how you can intervene on those pathways. For example, you can give uh, people ca uh, cash transfers. You can give the poor. You can try and alleviate their poverty. That happens in some countries, but then they don't measure the effect on mental health. So we need better surveys, epidemiological research, to capture some of those effects to see if it really did make a difference or not at the population level. So I'll leave it there. Thanks very much and enjoy the rest of the uh, conference. Um, so, um, Dan, thanks very much. Uh, can I just check in oh, the I'm audience? Can you put your hand up if you're a PhD student? <laughs> Who's, who are the students? Oh, fantastic. Okay. What we want to do is to build capacity. Because the, the issues that Dan's just outlined, that's not a three-year project. That's a, what, a 30-year project? Yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so we've got a lot of heavy lifting to do, and, uh, and we, we see that as the next generation. Questions for Dan whilst Dan Christian's getting ready. Don't be shy. Yes. I'll oh, just wait for the microphone. Um, so thank you. It was a lovely talk. And um, so my question is about the benefit to cost ratio of treatment. Mm -hmm. And so I was wondering if you're able to, um, to also include the impact um, of treating mental health that then improves physical health and, and well-being, and if that's reflected as well in those models. I, I'm, I'm assuming not because I think it's probably complicated to model, but I was wondering if you had any thoughts about that. Well, yes, you guessed it right. Um, it, it does not uh, capture. I mean, this is this is another. Uh, I mean, this is one of the main topics, right, uh, for the uh, the prof professorship. Uh, looking at this whole topic of uh, comorbidity, um, you heard a bit from Harvey about some of the problems in how to. You know, there's been a long problem, you know, in how to deal with that comorbidity issue in GBD. And it's somewhat, you know, uh, inherited, you know, when you're trying to look at the flip side and how to avert the disorder. And so if you do a conceptual model or framework like we did for this re global return on investment work, it's there. You know, it's one of the effects that, you know, you should be able to see an effect on uh, by re reducing uh, incidence or pr uh, prevalence of depression. You would see some benefit on uh, outcomes for cardiovascular disease outcomes, for example. 
we can't do that at the moment without much more sophisticated modeling. So once this guy's you know, worked it all out, then uh, given us some simple algorithms, then maybe we'll be able to uh, incorporate it more easily into, uh, into future modeling but studies. But you've got two jobs, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> but it's the students here and, and, the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the intellectual capital in this room, I think. I, th I actually am confident it can be worked out. So, but I think, mm -hmm. we, we need a lot of PhD students, seriously. It's not just, we have two funded by Niels Bohr but we actually need 20. And we need people like you to supervise us as well, people like you and her. Hey, Dan, thank you very much. We need to move on now.